How's it going, everybody? Brian Alpers and Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio, May 14, 2024. Figure 4, online.com, slash wrestlingobserver.com. Got a lot to get into today, including the debut of Mercedes Monet for AW, as expected, at the Big Business Show. But we do have some very important things to talk about first, including the death of Jackie Crockett, Dave, passed away. Yeah, uh, Jackie Crockett, of course, was... um a member of the famous Crockett family, one of the sons of Jim Crockett Sr., and um, worked, he was, you know, very well known as the, the, one of the cameramen for uh, Jim Crockett Promotions and later for uh, World Championship Wrestling. He was in the business basically until the folding of WCW in 2001. And, um, you know, he was um, you know, involved in all of the family, you know, business with uh, it was Jackie Francis, David, Jim Jr. I believe those were the all of the kids. Um, and uh, so anyway, yeah, very sad to hear he'd been in bad health for a while. And, um, you know, always unfortunate. We also have an update on the death of Yutaka Yoshie, who passed away after a wrestling match last week. He went backstage and his condition deteriorated rapidly, they said. Well, what happened, he was he, he had a match. There was nothing unusual that happened in the match. Um, it was the same thing that happened to a, there was a Mexican wrestler from Monterey named um, Ray Destroyer who um, had a match also. In, uh, his match was actually 11 days ago, but he just passed away, I believe, yesterday. Um, and it was just, you know, it's funny when, when you know, you talk about these, these deaths in the ring or right after the ring and all the crazy stuff that we see and, and these, you know, neither of these deaths had anything to do with, with that, you know, with a... Um, Ray Destroyer, it was um, believed to be like a brain aneurysm that he just suffered in the ring, just normal in a match, nothing, you know, something he was predisposed to. And with um, Yutaki Oshie, um, you know, it was, um, you know, essentially a heart condition. Um, and, um, you know, um, he was backstage and everything was fine. Match was over. Nothing Nothing special happened in the match. And then he, you know, just said that he wasn't feeling well. And they rushed him to the hospital. Um, and he died in the hospital. Um, Yotaki Ushie was uh, 50 years old. He'd been wrestling for about 30 years. Um, was New Japan. He, he was with New Japan from like 1994 to 2006. And then he worked indies after that. And, um, you know, he was a kind of a powerful... Um, bulky guy, you know, about who's built at 350 pounds. Um, I'm trying to think who he would be, um, you know, considered, you know, similar to the United States. Maybe like a, a, he wasn't as big as Keith Lee, but um, or as powerful as Keith Lee, but I guess similar in some ways. You know, that type of um, just big, thick guy. Not quite as big as Bronson Reed, I would say either. Or at least as, as, but similar, similar type of body, you know, just a big, um, not, not particularly tall, you know, maybe 5'10", but, um, you know, he was um, a solid wrestler, um, did well in New Japan, held the tag team titles there, um, was not a, a superstar, was in G1s, um, not, you know, not a finalist or anything like that. He did well in some tag team tournaments. And uh, held tag team titles. Uh, he was once held tag team title with Hiroshi Tanahashi when Tanahashi was uh, on his way up. And in fact, um, had a major match at the Tokyo Dome with Tanahashi um, when they were both. This was like over twenty years ago because it was the under thirty. They used to have an under thirty championship, and Tanahashi was the champion, and Yoshie uh, challenged him for that title at the Tokyo Dome um, many many years ago. I think you know, obviously over 20 years ago i think it was like uh 21 i think it was 21 years ago actually i think it was the 2003 tokyo dome show and um you know tanahashi won that match but um solid performer and uh always you know it's always uh sad when something like this happens we've also got mark coleman who is in very rough shape after an incident where his house caught fire and it was, his it was, dog it was, started barking at like 4 o'clock a.m. and alerted Mark Coleman. 
He got his parents out of the house. He went back into the house to try to rescue the dog, and the dog did not survive. And uh, he, he was unable to rescue the dog. But so, smoke so, inhalation. So the dog, the dog woke him up at four in the morning, barking. His dog Hammer, and um, he got out, ran in, uh, got his dad out, uh, ran in, got his mom out. His mom got burned, um, and ran in again to get the dog out and about that time um you know first responders came and um he collapsed trying to get his dog out due to a smoke inhalation and they got him out they did not save they were not able to save the dog they airlifted him to the hospital in Toledo he was in Fremont Ohio um at his parents I believe it was his parents house but um they um you know, he's in intensive care. He was put in an induced coma. From the last word we heard, I believe that he was responsive. So uh, best of luck to him. Mark Coleman, obviously, um, you know, I know him, I don't say very well, but I certainly know him. Um, you know, talked to him many occasions, done stories with him. And, and uh, you know, was, he and I, were we, we had kind of a connection because of stuff I wrote about him. Um after the Shogun Hua fight, um, you know, he loved the line I wrote about uh, Vince Lombardi. Um, Vince Lombardi said fatigue makes cowards out of all of us. Vince Lombardi never met Mark Coleman because it was this match with him and Shogun Hua in the UFC where he was exhausted and he, you know, just completely exhausted. He was past his prime and everything like that. And um, he just wouldn't quit, you know, and never gave up, never showed any fear. And um, it's really... Uh, sad, you know. I mean, Mark, one of his best friends was Kevin Randleman, who died um, in, you know, in his early, I believe, in his early forties. But I remember when Kevin died, and I talked to Mark around that at that point. And um, yeah, um, you know, he was uh, Mark Coleman. I don't know if you, people know this. Mark Coleman was uh, his. I don't want to say his hero, but Mark Coleman was like, I believe, like a freshman in college at Miami of Ohio when, when Brian Pillman was a senior. And he was a major admirer of Brian Pillman. Brian Pillman was like, you know, the football star at the college. And Mark was a, a wrestler there. And, um, you know, Mark ended up being a NCAA champion wrestler, but at Ohio State. He switched from um, Miami of Ohio to Ohio State. And then he went to the, uh, I think he took second in the world championships uh, seventh in the Olympics, and then he was training for the ninety. This is in, in ninety one and ninety two. So in the ninety six Olympics, it was Mark Kerr, Mark Coleman, I think uh, Danny Chade, who was a San Jose guy. Who who um, I actually didn't know Danny Chade, but we have many mutual friends, um, including Scott Coker, who went to high school with Danny Chade. Um, and um, you know, Danny Chade was actually the uh, the original trainer of uh, Daniel Pewter too, wrestling trainer, but. Um, so, so they were like all going for the 220 pound slot at the Olympics, and obviously Kurt won it. Um, so Mark, you know, went from um, you know attempting to qualify for the Olympics, uh, did not make the final two uh, because that that weight class was so loaded in in '96, and Kurt won the gold medal obviously in that year, and then Mark went into UFC immediately, and um, his wrestling was uh, his power wrestling was such that. Nobody could stop him early on at that point in UFC, and he won. Um, he won a, a tournament, and I think he won a couple of tournaments, and he beat uh, Dan Severin, and he became you know the UFC heavyweight champion, and defended it. He was in that very legendary fight with Maurice Smith, a uh, game changing fight. I remember all the build to that, you know, where everybody thought that Mark Coleman was going to destroy Maurice Smith, and Frank Shamrock was training Maurice. And they basically worked out a game plan to, uh, you know, get Mark to get tired because they saw the weakness in Mark in, in long fights. He started getting tired. So, um, you know, he took Maurice down, was pounding on him. And Maurice had to sit there and take it um, and just did. And then Mark got tired and Maurice ended up uh, winning the championship from him. But Mark's biggest accomplishment, obviously, was winning the original pride grand prix the one with um that had the hoist gracie sakuraba fight 
and um, you know he was uh, he beat Igor Vovchanchin in the finals, and um, UFC Hall of Famer, and um, you know Mark's body took a lot of toll, you know, from everything. I mean, he had a hip replaced and everything, but uh, fearless guy. You know, he was a, a street fighter before being in the UFC, and um, yeah, just wish Mark. Mark, the best of luck. Um, you know, I really, uh, you know, every time, you know, Mark was, I really like Mark a lot. And um, I was really, really sad to hear that story, um, you know, yesterday. And uh, thank God he's, uh, I hope, you know, he's, it appears he's getting better. I hope, I hope it turns out well for him. And Mark also did pro wrestling for a while, too, in Japan um, with Kevin Randleman. And, um, you know, for for guys who didn't have a lot of training, they were. You know, Kevin Randleman was actually a natural for pro wrestling. He would have been, you know, if if he would have had the shot, if if WWE would have signed him, which they didn't for whatever reason. Um, Kevin, I think, would have been a superstar as a pro wrestler. He was just an amazing, amazing athlete. And um, Mark, I think, could have done well for his limited. Um, Mark had good matches considering how limited his, you know, training was and how limited his experience was, and was a a star in pro wrestling in Japan for a while there. And um, he was involved in, there was a, a match. Did you ever hear about the match that he had with um in the IGF? The, 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 the one where he got shot on? I vaguely remember this story. Yeah, he was, this was... um. Who who he, was he in with? I forgot the guys. I think it was maybe Shinsu Sun. Um, I, for, um, I forgot the name of the guy off the top of my head. But it was a tough guy. And I don't know what happened, but he was double crossed. He didn't know it, and the guy shot on him, and and um, you know basically beat him in the match that Mark was supposed to win, um, which you know was a. I know a lot of the talent that was there was very very upset, you know that something like that was allowed to happen. But um, you know it was kind of sad too because you know it's one thing if it's a fair fight and you know it's a fight. It's another thing where you're trying to take, because the guy had the great rep from UFC, you're trying to take his rep by, you know, essentially shooting on him without his knowledge in a worked fight, so in a worked match, in a worked pro wrestling match. So um, that was like one of the things, because that's when a lot of the people, that actually was um, why Kimbo Slice never wrestled for the IGF, because of the fear that they would double-cross him and shoot with him, because um, he was ready to start around that time and saw what happened there and um you know he had his rep and he just didn't trust him well i'm gonna try and find out who this is in the meantime what is the latest on the new japan cup so um let's see they are in the final um uh fine you know they're in the, the next round um let me see what the date of this is the 14th is going to be Sonata and Jack Perry, which is a rematch of that Forbidden Door match, which Sonata won when he was IWGP champion. David Finley also on the 14th facing Hiroki Goto. And then on the other side, um, it is um, Evil and Hikuleo have a match. And then, um, is it Evil and Hikuleo? Um, did, I'm trying to think what happened there. Or did evil? Um, let's see what what I have this bracket in front of me. Um, evil and Hikaleo, and I think the winner will go on to face the winner of Shingo Takagi and Gabe Kidd, and then Yoda Suji, who had a big win over Jeff Cobb, uh, faces El Fantasmo, and then uh, Ren Narita and Zack Saber Jr. have a match. So. That's where we're at in the tournament. I have I am still behind a little bit on the tournament. Um, I know that the um, people were really raving about the 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 um, Yoda Suji and Jeff Cobb match and the Gabe Kid Calum Newman match and the Shingo Takagi and Yuya Urimura match in particular. Um, the best one that I've seen so far was Ishii and Chase Owens, where Chase Owens won, and then uh, Chase Owens ended up losing his next round match to. Uh, Go to. All right. Well, I haven't found the name yet, but uh, I'll do my best. Tony, I had a meeting with the uh, the new head of stardom. 
Yeah, Taro Okada. Yeah, they were. He was at the show, and Mina Shirakawa wrestled on uh, Ring of Honor against Adam Anna J. And so, um, you know, there there will be stardom and CMLL wrestlers on the Forbidden Door show when they do that show uh, in June. And um, so that's uh, you know, so he came in, and uh, that kind of explains, you know, again when um, Tony Khan tweeted those tweets about uh, Ross Yogawa. Um, you know, it was, you know, a definite loyalty to stardom and Ross Yogao was quitting stardom. So, uh, that's what's going on there. But, um, I believe that, um, on the, uh, April 5th ring of honor pay-per-view, um, a couple of the stardom wrestlers are going to be on that show. Um, so, or, or whatever it's like, it's not pay-per-view, but the, uh, honor club special on the Friday night of WrestleMania is head to head with the hall of fame. Um, so, so, um, I think it's, um, Azumi's going to be on that show. So, and maybe Mina Shirakawa since, uh, Mina Shirakawa was on this Ring of Honor show. So, um, and I heard that she looked very good on the show too in, uh, tonight. Yeah, that match and, uh, well, we'll get into the Rampage spoilers later, but, uh, a lot of, a lot of raves about one of the matches on that show. We have the uh, full WWE Hall of Fame for this year. They, uh, as Do we you have noted... The full? I think there's there's one there's still one in question. Okay, you wrote an article on the front page and said we had the full Triple H Hall of Fame. Um, I have everyone that's confirmed, but okay. uh, but there's there's well, Thunderbolt there's, Patterson and Leah Maivia have been added. Yes, they have. So um, Thunderbolt was an interesting one um, for Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame because. Um, you know, I mean, Thunderbolt was, um, he was very much an activist, um, and very much against the established, in, the establishment in pro wrestling. I mean, one of the things, um, he made a lot of noise in Georgia. You know, the basic just with Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt, um, you know, was, was a, a star, a legitimate star. And, um, he would, um, you know, Basically, when, when in in Georgia, him and Jim Wilson were trying to get a union. They were trying to get le- regulation because Georgia never regulated pro wrestling. Um, they tried to start their own promotion against Jim Barnett. That didn't. Shinichi work out well. Suzukawa. Shinichi Suzukawa. Right, right. That's the, that's the guy who shot on Mark Holman. Yes, yes. Sorry to interrupt, but I found it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Harry Smith. Um. Tapped him out once in a training session. I remember that. Wow. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, he was a tough guy, though. You know, I mean, he had a real background in, in, in submissions and everything like that. But, um, you know, obviously they're not, you know, going to, you know, whether it was Anoki doing that um, on his own or the guy did it on his own, you know, you'll hear different stories. But, but um, the, um, but anyway, with, um, what was the deal that we were talking about? Uh, Hall of Fame. Yeah, so Thunderbolt, um, yeah, yeah, so in, in Georgia, what what happened, you know, it was one of those things where um, Thunderbolt and Jim Wilson would be campaigning against them, they would get publicity, they charge their own promotion. Thunderbolt was with the IWA, with Eddie Einhorn, and as was Jim Wilson, um, when they went against the uh, established, you know, they attempted to go national against the established territories in 75, and then um, what would happen would be that... Uh, you know, the Barnett would make up with them, and then they would come in, uh, or you know, Thunder and Thunderbolt was a was a legitimate draw, and it was and it was he was a legitimate star. Um, I don't think he was that great in the ring or anything, but um, his promos his promos worked. You know, I mean, I actually didn't think he was a good promo at all, but he was an effective promo. Um, it the the fans got into his promos. Um, and he did draw reasonably well at certain points in time. He was very popular with the with the black fan base, especially. Um, and you know he would be, he would work there, and then he would quit, and then he would go back to, um, you know, going uh, against the establishment. He came when when um, late seventies here in California, Thunderbolt and Bearcat Wright and Ron Pope, who was also known as Magnificent Zulu. 
Um, they testified in Sacramento, basically, wrestling's all fake. These promoters don't pay well. Um, the times Ron Pope's pay in working for Roy Shire was horrible. I mean, ungodly horrible. Um, and he wasn't getting a lot of dates. So they went to the commission. And I just remember that uh, there was a period because they basically said wrestling's all fake, that um, it didn't get anything done positive as far as um, any better treatment for black wrestlers or anything like that. But they did inadvertently or advertently. I don't know what they were, what their the goal was. But in it, they didn't have to do this in Los Angeles. And I don't really know why. I guess because the commission was based in Sacramento. But before the shows for a period of time, uh, for Roy Shire's big time wrestling show, they would have this disclaimer, you know, in, in, in voiceover at the start of the show, and it would say these wrestling exhibitions are sanctioned by the California State Athletic Commission. The winner and losers have been predetermined ahead of time by the promoter, right on the show at the beginning of every show. For this went on for several months, and then I think I don't remember it after that, but it was. Um, I mean, it wasn't any big, I don't know how to say it. It's like, it's not like wrestling's popularity went down and they went out like on the start of the show and all these people used to go like, oh, if anyone ever found out like wrestling wasn't real, you know what I mean? It would kill the business. And we had it here and it's like, I, I remember when it was on and it was kind of like, nobody really said a word about it. It was sort of like, okay, I mean, we all know it anyway. You know, it was weird that they had to say it in front of the show, but... um I and mean, business wasn't great, but it wasn't any better or worse, you know, because of that. Um, then um, he had a lawsuit settlement, I think, with Crockett. Um, and he actually got a, a multi-year contract from Crockett at, and if I recall the number, it would be like, it was a hundred grand a year at a time when, I mean, it's not like nobody made a hundred grand a year. I mean, obviously the top, wrestlers for Crockett did but that was a very big amount of money there and he had it guaranteed for a couple of years and he got a push because it was guaranteed and uh, this was when him and Ole Anderson were a babyface tag team and then when the contract was up um, it wasn't renewed and he was back out and uh, never wrestled again after that point that I can recall um, never went back to Crockett promotions or anything um, and then um in the late 90s, if you remember the lawsuit, remember the oh, Sonny yes, Ono? I do. The Sonny Ono lawsuit, right? Yes. With Kerry, Kerry Itcher, that everything. Thunderbolt was, um, I think his, uh, might have been his nephew, but Bobby Walker, if, if you remember the name. Mm -hmm. Bobby Hard Work Walker, or sometimes called Hard to Watch Work Walker, was a guy who was related to him and wasn't getting a push. And, and quite frankly, you know, w didn't light the world on fire or anything in his, in his job role. But, you know, there was, an, there were enough people who could testify that a lot of the executives in WCW said pretty racist things, which did not look good in a court case, which ended up being settled for a, a pretty substantial amount of money in WCW at the end. I mean, that was actually the reason that Booker T was made world champion was because this lawsuit was there the first time. And not that Booker didn't deserve it, because he did, but the reason he got it was because this lawsuit was going on about how WCW was discriminating against black wrestlers. And Thunderbolt was one of the key guys spearheading that. And he'd been doing that, you know, for since the since the seventies, so it's interesting that that Thunderbolt, um, you know, is now lauded in the WWE Hall of Fame. Um, but you know, I mean, the the one thing that we learned is with the Vince McMahon when, when Vince McMahon picked the Hall of Fame, they had a certain quota thing, which was there has to be a black wrestler and there has to be a woman wrestler in every class, and in the new Hall of Fame. It appears that that is the same thing. Um, there's one woman, which was Bull Nakano and Thunderbolt. So um, that's the deal. Thunderbolt's announced today. And then probably, I don't know if it'd be tomorrow or Friday or whatever, but Leah Maivia uh, will be announced as a promoter. And um, it's, you know, I mean, Dwayne's going to give the speech. You know, it's like, 
at first when I, you know, if when I first when I saw Leah Maivia, it's kind of like, my God, there's like so few promoters in that Hall of Fame, and there's been so many legendary promoters. Um, I mean, I think the only one is uh, maybe Tootsmont and Vince Senior, who are partners in WWF, as far as the actual Hall of Fame, and then I think they put Paul Bosch and Jim Barnett in the Legacy Hall of Fame. But, I mean, all of these, you know, if you go through every famous promoter from Jack Curley to Sam Mushnick to, um, you know, Paul Bowser to Johnny Doyle, Lou Darrow, and uh, Don Owen and Jim Crockett Sr. and Jim Crockett Jr. And, I mean, there were a few, you know, Vern Gagne and Eddie Graham are in there, but they're in there as much wrestlers, or, or Bill Watts, but they're in as much for wrestling as for promoting. Um, but, I mean, when you look at, like, the... Uh, Shinma, who was was a promoter in Japan, that's because he was figure at WWE uh, uh, president. And Rossi Ogawa was offered it, but then when he didn't sign, we didn't sell the company, we didn't sell Stardom to WWE. That that didn't happen. But of all of these people, all these legendary promoters who changed the business, you know, none of them are in. And Liam Ivia is going to be put in. But at the end of the day, I mean, here's the reality: is is that those fans in Philadelphia, those sixteen thousand fans, and those people watching on Peacock, do they want? Are they watching to get a history lesson on Jack Curley or Sam Mushnick, or do they want Rock to do a promo? And the answer is pretty obvious. So there you go. So uh, Leah Maivia, one of the first promoters and the first woman promoter in the WWE Hall of Fame, and not even, you know, I mean, never really a, what I would call a. A successful promoter they that was a, was not a thriving industry I mean she would not even be the uh, third biggest promoter in Hawaii historically um, but you know there you go so um, Dwayne's grandmother and uh, if you watch Young Rock they had uh, a woman playing Leah Maivia um, you know and Dwayne when he was growing up he lived in Hawaii, and in fact, Nick Khan lived in Hawaii at the same time. And as the story goes, uh, they used to attend Leah Maivia's wrestling shows together, Nick Khan and, and Dwayne, when they were children. How about that? Yeah. As the story goes, you say. As the story goes. Well, I mean, I, I you know, like when I've talked to Nick Khan, I mean, he certainly was a wrestling fan, and he certainly told me that he went to matches in Vegas. Um and things like that. But I don't recall him ever telling me the Hawaii story. But later, you know, it became that they were best friends growing up in Hawaii. Um, so, I mean, and I presume they knew each other. Um, and and uh, Nick Khan did live in Hawaii with his Nick Khan and his sister. Did, who, who was His sister, by the way, was the showrunner for Young Rock. So they, you know, and the story is that they all went back as, as you know, to childhood together. Hmm. All right, uh, take us through these ratings, and we'll do the big business show. Okay. Um, let's see. So, um, yeah. So SmackDown ended up uh, tied for third for the week. So they made this one. This SmackDown this week has a has a shot. I, I'd say it being another show at number one because it law the the only shows that beat it were obviously. The Oscars, you know, which we're going to, you know, beat it handily. The Oscars had almost 20 million viewers, 3.48, I believe, in, um, that's not 3.48, it was 3.62, 3.82 in um, 18 to 49. And then the show that followed, Abbott Elementary on ABC, right after the Oscars, did a 1.43. But, you know, that's because so many people were watching the Oscars. So they were one and two. And SmackDown and um, The Bachelor were tied for third place this week um on cable raw was sixth uh be behind duke U north carolina it was behind the ufc show um two new shows um covering on, on fox news covering biden's state of the union address and an nba game um as far as the entertainment shows you know raw number one as always uh, Vanderpump was number two. AEW Dynamite was number three for the week. 
And that was that. So uh, NXT, 588,000, 0.16. One of the things with NXT is is the last couple of weeks when they've been at 0.16 has been when with Vanderpump rules now uh, on the show. So that's probably hurt them, head-to-head competition every week. And uh, also um, they had uh, college basketball, WCC tournament, uh, NBA game, and Vanderpump rules, you know, um, you know, as, as the key shows against them. So, um, you know, that's that's been essentially the 0.16 is, is the level that they've been doing the last couple of weeks. Raw was up after the low number the week before. Um, 1,751,000 viewers, 0.56. First on cable, uh, second of The Bachelor on all of television. But if you factor in the fact that The Bachelor's on ABC and Raw was on... Uh, USA and do an actual average for numbers. Raw actually handily ahead. So Raw really was uh, the strongest show on television on uh, Monday night. And then um, as far as the uh, the thing, the, the big quarter, I believe, was the uh, Cody Rhodes interview. Shocking. Like, I probably could have figured that out right after the show was over, that that would be, like, the really... Um, the really top quarter and everything like that. Um, it peaked at, do I have that? I don't even have that in front. I should have it in front of me somewhere. But um, And then uh, as far as Collision went, um, Collision did the tape show on Saturday night, 427,000 viewers, 0.13, down a little bit um, because of uh, the Duke you know, North Carolina game, which did a giant number. Biggest number of the week on cable, and also followed that was followed by the UFC, which did uh, 0.57, which is the biggest UFC number in a long, long time. The prelims to the uh, O'Malley fight, and and that it appears that that show, I mean that that UFC show on Saturday was a giant success. It did over a 14 million dollar gate, which was the uh, largest gate in UFC history for a fight that did not include Conor McGregor. Um, so Sean O'Malley is absolutely a big draw. Um, we don't have a pay-per-view number, but Dana White said it was the biggest pay-per-view ever headlined by a middle, by a phantom weight. And, um, the prelims did giant numbers and, um, collision was actually second behind ESPN in the time slot, 15th overall. So, you know, I mean, you know, and, and, Filled with tough Saturday night sports competition, but every Saturday night there's tough sports competition. So it was down a little bit from the show the week before, um, but easily explainable with the UFC head to head. And and I don't know that being a tape show hurt much, um, but you know it might hurt very slightly. All right. Well, the Dynamite show was a big business, and they did not waste any time as the show opened with a car arriving. We did not see who was in the car, but then they went to the ring, and the lights went out, and music played, and CEO appeared on the big screen, and Mercedes made her debut, and she's got a new song. Yeah, it uh, gets people to chant CEO constantly. Yeah, there was a lot of CEO chants on this show. Well, the and song chants it. So well, they do, jer- but when they turned the when they turned the the song yeah, yeah, yeah. off, they were also chanting. CEO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the show was built around her. I mean, and and she got she got a giant reaction. She and Will Ospreay, and and to an extent Okada as well, all got really big reactions on the show. So she did this long promo thanking all the fans and saying they were going to make moments and milestones here. And and AW talked about the people like Eddie Guerrero who'd. Made her believe that she could do this someday. Talked about dropping out of school to take care of her brother. 18 years old, 90 pounds, trained at Chaotic Wrestling. And she wanted to become the best women's wrestler of all time. And she noted that, I'm going to be watching this main event tonight. Riho and Willow Nightingale. Willow, we have unfinished business. But right now, I am all elite. And she danced. And uh, she did say she was... And she almost did CEO, just like Britt Baker, but she uh, she stopped She herself. sort of did. She sort of did. I think that's a natural feud if Britt Baker ever returns. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, 
Well, you know, what's the story on Britt Baker? Did you tell me? Uh, okay, she was. She did an interview. You know, she was. A, a I know that's the thing. Like she did that interview, and everybody thought, "Man, well, we got this big debut, and she's doing an interview, and maybe she'll be there tonight." And wasn't that the show? No, Bailey was there. Bailey, Bailey was went. there. Yes, in Bailey the, went uh, cheap seats. Uh, yeah, yeah. No sky boxes. Well, so sure. Cheap seats. That's well, I mean, it was way seat. up there. Those sky boxes are way up there, Dave. But they're not cheap seats. They're not cheap seats. No. But they're in the cheap seats. You know what I'm saying? Well, they're up there, but they're I would expensive call them cheap because seats. they bring food in for you. Yeah, they're expensive seats yes. usually. You know, I mean, they're very expensive. Um, they had 9,500 people at the show tonight. I mean, which is you know, it's a good number. I mean, I still think. You know, I mean, I I, I uh, okay. I can't even believe that the most elementary thing that you said that they should have advertised this that people somehow thought that like got up in arms and it's like what does anyone like know anything about the history of wrestling it's like do you realize there's actually a reason why they advertise matches for the last 140 years or maybe the church? reason that the people in charge are called promoters their right. job is to promote yeah it's like it's like there's something because WWE is is very hot right now, but even so, even so, WWE's hot right now. But it's like when when The Rock is on, they do in fact. Now they did they did bring him in as a surprise, but they now promote him, and when they promote him, they act. You know, I mean, they do. Well, sell hey, listen, tickets. if you want to talk about WWE, I mean, we've got three things for SmackDown. We have four things for next week's NXT. We have. Uh, Four things for this coming week's Raw, with a ton of names. I mean, they're, they announce, and to be fair also, I mean, we do already have five matches and segments announced for next week's Dynamite. Yeah, so yeah, that they, is a huge improvement. Yeah, they that, do have a lot uh, of If you're they, in Toronto, you know what's going on on the show next week. So well, we'll see how it does. That's a, that's a big one because... Um, they had, to me, a very disappointing advance for Toronto. I mean, but... They have a loaded show now. Um, I think tickets were maybe around five thousand. Um, I haven't looked at the number, but I think it's somewhere in that range. And um, you know, I mean the the building. I think, um, um, geez, they're they're in, I think they're in the Coca Cola Coliseum. I think, and that's so they could probably get about seven to eight in there. I think if they sell it out. Um, but I mean, it's it's you know, it's Adam Copeland and Christian in an I Quit match for the title. Among other things, I mean that's the big one though. And um, Mercedes will do a promo on the show next week, so uh, we'll see how uh, the tickets move this week. Uh, I think the important thing about this show is: did fans get the hint that she was coming back at the end of the show? If they did, I think the show is going to do very well. If they didn't get the hint. Well, we'll and I know. think we could have the deal we had on SmackDown when The Rock came out at the beginning of the show and then he left and everyone stopped watching the show. So. Well, we'll see, well, we'll see. The quarters will be very interesting because if if people believed that she was coming back, they they might have stayed. If they didn't, Willow Nightingale and Riho in the main event segment, as as much as that was a pretty good match and everything, and and both are very charismatic. Um. It's probably it would probably on its own die in a main event segment. So if it doesn't die, um, that tells you that the people enough people knew. If it uh, goes way up, you know, I mean, like the, the quarters will, will tell the story as far as like what people thought and didn't think. Um, it's it's interesting because again, um, you know, the the big thing for them right now is is uh, rebuilding. Um, I don't know. Will Osprey said it right? The feeling. Will rebuilding yes. the feeling. I mean, that is what it is. It's like if they can get that what they had before back, and you know they really pushed on the show that this is the strongest roster they've ever had, and it is. It is an incredibly strong roster of talent. It, it, it might be not not for marquee stars. In no way in mark for marquee stars is this the strongest roster. It can't even compare with like with the roster WCW had with stars and and WWF had. You know, in, in in different periods and stars, but as far as in ring talent, depth of in ring talent, and high quality in ring talent, I mean, this is, um, 
I'd have to look, you know, that that 2018-ish New Japan is 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 kind of incredible. But this roster is pretty damn great. Um and you know, that's not the be all and end all. I mean, it's like the the key is it's is is getting people interested and wanting to see the stuff and getting it hot and it's very very difficult when WWE is hot for another company to be hot. But um you know, I mean, we'll see with Mercedes and Will Ospreay and Okada are, are, are really, they're huge additions. They really are. I mean, I knew Mercedes would get a big reaction. She did as far as staying power and as far as interest in matches and things like that. You know, we'll have to see, you know, I mean, it, is, is it going to, is it going to stay? Osprey is way more over than I expected. Um, and, and he did a great job on his promo tonight, too. Um, and Okada, I, I think, um, you know, Okada has a very defined character. Um, it's not just, here's Okada. I mean, he's like total heel. It's interesting they're doing the Okada Eddie Kingston match, not on the pay-per-view, but they're doing it next week. Oh, Wednesday. we'll get to that. We'll get to yeah. that. We had Samoa Joe and Wardlow for the AW title, and Samoa Joe's over as a total babyface in this match. Oh, yeah. And they had a good match, and at the end... It didn't do anything for me, I gotta say. I mean, I was... I, I don't know what it was. a good match. I thought that... Uh, I thought it was a very sluggish match. I don't know. They didn't, it didn't seem to have any spark at all. Well, Wardlow hit his falling knee, and Joe kicked out of that, and then he went for the senton, and Joe moved out of the way, hit the punches in the corner. Wardlow went underneath, hit the power bomb, and then he goes for the pop-up power bomb, but Joe avoids it and leaped onto Wardlow's back like he was a lightweight and grabbed this guy in the choke, and Wardlow went out. Totally clean finish here. No mm. interference. Nobody ran in. And then after the match, Swerve stormed down to the ring. And uh, there was one thing I did not like about this, and that is that they sent out all these officials and security to get Swerve out of there, and he starts beating these dudes up right and left. And uh, and Hangman beat up one referee and got suspended. Yeah. And somehow I don't think there's going to be any ramifications for Swerve destroying a dozen guys that are working for AEW here. Well, you can always beat up security. I don't think people – it's, it's referees that are, that are protected. You realize how ridiculous that is? I'm, I'm just saying that's... Ah, these security guys. That's always They're been, worthless humans. That's always not been like the case. Not like a referee. That's always been the case. People beat up security guards left and right, and there's never any Terrible. issues. Terrible. Terrible. You know, you know, I um, stand for security. And also, also, when it comes to beating up on um, referees, generally speaking, the only people who get punished for beating up on referees are baby faces. Even though Hangman is kind of like, I don't know if he's a baby face or a heel, but... You know, like the the heels usually can get away with it. I mean, Jesus Christ, how many, you know, uh, how many when you have heel groups and every, and factions that are beating up referees, you know, that's kind of with impunity most of the time. Not for old Hangman, he's suspended. Well, yeah, well, they without pay reason, from the elite, they needed they needed a reason to to write him off for a while. We had Alex Marvez interviewing the elite, and. Uh, they said, uh, 14 years of friendship. This guy helped us when we were at our lowest of lows. We helped him out as well. I could probably give you 14 million other reasons, too, they said, yeah. which is a reference to the Tokyo Sports article, which claimed that Okada was being paid $14 million. Yeah. And, uh, which may not be accurate. You don't say. No. Okada said he was coming for Penta, Pac, and Eddie. And then and Okada says, and I quote, Anyway, say happy birthday to Matthew. Yeah, it was so, his birthday today. Is Alex, it was 39? Alex says, happy birthday, Matthew. And Okada says, no, sing it. <laughs> they make poor Alex Marvez sing happy birthday to Matthew. And they cut him off. We I am all in on this heel Okada. He is great. I, I like Okada. He's good. Yes. The, and the, then, thing, the thing is, though, as much of a heel as he is, the place goes crazy for everything he does. Well, yes. There's a lot of people miscast in this promotion, but we have to yeah. deal with it. Eddie Kingston, Pac, and Penta versus Okada and the Young Bucks. Good match, very good match. Breaks down into the six-way. Everybody's hitting all these big moves. And then the referee's distracted. Nick ends up hitting Eddie with the low blow. Okada hits the Rainmaker and pins him. They then announced... Get ready for this. Okada is facing Eddie next con- week... For the Continental Championship. For the Continental title. Not the no. Continental Crown. 
No, only the Continental Belt, the 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 uh, the strong title and the Ring of Honor title are not on the line. So Eddie's going to be the champion of those two, and Okada's going to be the Continental champion. This whole Triple Crown thing is going away. Well, that that's... unless Eddie wins, which well, I... hold on, hold on, hold yes. on. They did announce this ridiculous thing. It is under Continental rules. Yes, because in storyline, this Tony Khan character does not give a fuck if you interfere in any of these matches. However, if it is for the Continental title, you are not allowed to interfere. Yeah. So it is possible, I believe, possible, but I think unlikely, that in fact there will be interference to lead to a disqualification, and all the titles will be on the line at the pay-per-view. Because I can't fathom either A, you created a triple crown and you're already splitting it up, or B, Eddie is beating Okada in Okada's first major match yeah, in AEW. That, that would be a huge mistake. Neither of these make any sense to me whatsoever. Yeah. So I'm voting I mean, for I, disqualification. I, 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 I figured that Okada was going to win the, 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 you know, the, the triple crown. Um, and then, like, you know, defend the title on the Ring of Honor show. But that's obviously not happening. Well, no, I actually thought he would win it at the pay-per-view after the Ring of Honor show. So... Uh, I don't know. I wonder who Eddie's wrestling on the pay-per-view. I wonder what's going to happen on that pay-per-view. It's April 5th. So we got to, we're, we're, we're not that many weeks away. It's not away. April 5th. The, the, um, super card, the super card of honor? Oh, super card of honor. Yeah. Yes. They are talking about the AW pay-per-view. No, the other one's April 21st in St. Louis. Then we had this Will Ospreay interview and man, this guy is incredible. He, the place just went he nuts so, for this guy. He has so much charisma. He cut such a great promo here, talking about how he he grew up and he idolized Brian Daniels and he wanted to have a career just like him. And he said that, you know, Brian told me to prove I'm the best wrestler in the world, but I want to remind him of something. Everybody was talking about one move after my match with Kenny Omega, the Tiger Driver 91. I dropped this guy right on his head. Wasn't, wasn't that the, supposed to be the Storm Driver? No, this this was a Tiger Driver that he dropped him on his head with. Yeah, but they they renamed it the Storm Driver, but I guess he's he's unrenamed it. Well, it doesn't matter what they name it. He can call it whatever he wants. It's his well, move. It, he, he called it the Storm Driver, but now they're calling it the Tiger. I guess because that was the original name of it. So he says, Brian Danielson, the most violent man on television, asked me, was it worth it? And he said, speaking as a guy who was actually in the match, with blood pissing out of my head... And every time my heart beat, more blood came out. Standing there as a winner, I can definitely say, yes, it was worth it. And he said, everyone's talking about restore the feeling. I am the feeling. This match is about reminding people what AEW is. We're going to take the best wrestler in the world against the best wrestler of the 21st century. Only one man walks out the winner. He says, when I walk into the ring, it's my life or yours, and I don't plan on dying. So I should hope not. God damn, what a fucking promo this was. If I were WWE, I'd be kicking myself. Oh my god, you, you idiots. Took the, you what took were the you words. Thinking? You took the words out of Look, look. There were certain things that Tony Khan did and also, you know, there's there's it's it's when it comes to like Will Ospreay, number one Tony Khan offered a lot of money. But the other thing is is that Tony Khan has has gone to his shows at your call. He's seen him there. You know, he has, he's never seen him in Japan, but he's seen his shows in New York Hall and knows him and and will trust that Tony Khan's going to do the right thing with him. And, you know, with WWE, you don't know. But, you know, when I was watching this, my conclusion was exactly what you said. I just think that, like, if Paul Levesque is watching this, he's going like, holy fuck. I mean, like, they know he's a good wrestler, but I don't think they know that he's the charismatic person and talker and can get over like keep 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 in mind this is his i mean yeah he did a couple of matches before and he certainly has a rep with the hardcore fans because he's the best wrestler in the world but he was in there in front of a lot of fans that that probably were not regular AEW fans including many that probably came to see Mercedes and that guy was over like crazy after Literally two matches on this run, you know, granted they were incredible matches, but it's still two matches. He started just a couple of weeks ago, 10 days ago, actually, right? 11 days ago, whatever it is, 10 days ago. Um, and he's like, 
getting this kind of a reaction. And yeah, I think that they, I mean, I know people in WWE when, when, when it, this was going down, it was becoming very clear that he was going to AEW and not WWE. And, you know, they offered a lot less money. And I know people there were going like, uh, he didn't real, they didn't realize, he didn't realize, you know, they, they knew, but he just didn't realize. He just thought it's, ah, uh, you know, one of these great workers, you know. Um, but this guy has a chance to be, um, you know, I mean, we'll see. But he's got more than, than, you know, as far as complete package. There's very few people, you know, as far as complete total package. Um, and certainly, is there, any, is there anyone his age that you'd say is complete total package? There's no guys? one in any age. Kidding me? Well, he Roman said, Reigns. he said. I mean, in the ring, there's he, no one. He is at another level. And he is. He is in the ring. But as far as like the, um, you know, I mean, it's it's funny because I kept thinking like, well, what what, would we say? Compare him to Cody. And obviously, you know, bell to bell wrestler, you know, he's he's much better than Cody. But you know what? It's like Cody's super, super, super over. And Cody's a very good talker. But I really felt that that Osprey's got more charisma than Cody. Now, Cody's a million times more over because of the exposure he's had the last couple of years. But it's like. If, you know, I, I, I think as far as like complete package and everything like that, and he's eight, eight, nine years, eight years younger, I believe, than Cody. And it's like they had the chance to get a guy, you know, look at all the business that Cody has driven for them. And they have a chance to get a guy who's a better wrestler, eight years younger. And, and, and he's able to, the one thing he was able to do tonight was prove they can do a really good promo without swearing because he'd never proven that before he'd he'd done some fantastic promos but he used very much vulgar words that you cannot use on american television that you can use on japanese press conferences or you can use in a uh on on you know in a uh uk face-to-face in the arena thing on streaming tell on streaming but he um you know he proved he can keep his uh words and not get carried away in his promo and forget and um yeah they this 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 is probably um one of the best signings Tony Khan ever made since the original you know the original Kenny Omega and people and Chris Jericho and people and Moxley at the very beginning we had a Deanna promo. It's Tony Storm and Mariah May versus Deanna and a partner next week in Toronto, which will be revealed later. Then we had Darby Allen and Jay White, and they had a good match. Darby's all taped up, and every bump yeah. he takes, he's selling like crazy. And then finally, they're fighting outside, and Darby goes for a coffin drop, and Jay rolls to the apron. So Darby decides he's going to do the coffin drop onto Jay on the apron, but Jay moves, and Darby splatted on the edge of the apron. He barely and hit the, the apron and, and hit the floor. He just barely nicked the apron on the way down. God. How he, is he going to climb that freaking mountain? Well, he barely makes it at nine. Jay pins him. And then they do the angle where he's going to climb Mount Everest, so we got to break his leg. So Jay goes to break his leg, and out comes the rest of the Bang Bang Scissor Gang. And they're telling him, don't do it, don't do it, you don't need to do this. They start trying to help poor Darby to the back, and Billy's screaming at Jay. And Billy turns his back, and Jay White takes that chair, and he clobbers him with a chair shot. Acclaimed hit the ring, they get their ass beat. So really, at the end of the day, I guess it just didn't have anything to do with Jay White for a while. They just couldn't come up with something. So we had weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of the Bang Bang Scissor Gang. All so that Jay White and the guns could turn on them, and we are right back where we started. Yeah. That's what's well, going on. Well, I presume that they're going to have a, you know, a trios championship match, even though they both have trios belts. Man, we can unify these damn belts, because we got way too many of them. I'll tell you that right now. Boy, if they break up that freaking uh, Continental thing, that adds two more belts. I know. That's the last thing they need. We had Jericho and Hook versus the Mogul Embassy. And this is actually pretty good. Hook avoids, uh, they did a bunch of spots at the end. Hook avoids a spot, runs them together. Jericho yanks toe outside. And so Hook puts the red rum on Khan. Khan's trying to fight it, so Jericho grabs his legs, puts him in the lion tamer. They have a double submission on. But then Jericho hits a Silver King drop kick on Toa. Khan taps out. Good finish. Jericho and Hook win. 
And then they did a segment later where Jericho told Hook, you know, I see you as a future world champion, but I need to know what it's like to stand across the ring from you. And so he challenged him to next week, Chris Jericho versus Hook. I didn't, Canada. Expect, I didn't expect that. So I quickly. sure did not. I, I figured they were a team in the tournament, which they may well be. We don't have brackets yet. They're supposed to announce those tomorrow. Bra- brackets supposed to be Friday, right? I think it's tomorrow. But tomorrow? We'll know, I thought it was Thursday, but okay. one way or the other, we're going to have them the next day or two. We do know that. Yeah. Kyle O'Reilly does a promo. He's facing Brian Keith on Saturday, and he talks about how I couldn't even lift my daughter. Everything's better. I'm back. Got to figure out if I can hang. And uh, he challenges Keith, and then Roddy walks up and says, Listen, if you want to do this on your own, you're on your own. They hug. Roddy walks off, and Kyle says, Yeah. First match back Saturday, I'm going to do it on my own. And he gulps, and he walked away, and I just thought, Well, this guy's uh, guy's getting help on Saturday and joining the uh, Undisputed. Could be wrong. You know, That's it's what fun. I got out of it's, that. It's I I hope Kyle is the wrestler that he was when he got hurt. You know, like originally, because Kyle Riley was really a hell of a wrestler, really underrated. I mean, you add him to this this lineup of people. I mean, it's it's you know, again, there's there's so many, and there's only only so much TV time, and there's only so many people you can push. But I mean, as far as like an in ring talent, freaking Kyle O'Reilly was was fantastic. You know, before he got hurt, so. I don't know if he's going to feud with those guys or, he's, or, or what's going to happen. I don't know. The way he did this promo and so sadly saying he was going to go off on his own, I didn't buy it for a second. I could be yeah. wrong. Then we had uh, Riho and Willow Nightingale. Mercedes ran into Riho backstage and wished her luck. And I don't know how tall this Riho is, but Mercedes looked about six feet tall in this segment. She towered over Riho. Riho Rio's really short. <laughs> Let me tell you who's not tall is Mercedes. Yeah. Well, then we had uh, Riho and Willow Nightingale, and uh, they had a very good main event, and crowd was super into it, great heat, and uh, finally at the end they're fighting, and Willow tries a flip dive off the apron and crashes hard on the cement. That did not look good. And then Rio hits a double foot stomp off the apron, throws her in the ring, hits a German... My one complaint about this match, and I have to say it because I saw myself do it when I watched videos back in the day. When you're as small as Riho, and you're throwing around Willow Nightingale with suplexes, it's just ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. But she did that with Nyla Rose. Dude, she's lot bigger so than Willow. small. And the problem was, one of them, she almost killed Willow. She tried to do Northern Lights, and Willow barely made it over. And she landed high on her neck, and that one was scary. But finally, Willow hit a Dr. Bomb pinder, and then the lights go out. Come back on, and Julia is staring down Willow. And then Sky jumps Willow from behind. They're beating her down. The fans are chanting CEO. And, of course, they hit Mercedes music, and she runs down to the ring. And she has that new finish. And, uh, and thankfully, uh, Julia took it great because... Uh, We've seen it at least once where the person did not take it. I forget who it was. It was a, was it was it Kyrie. Might have been. It might have been it Kyrie. 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 Somebody Kyrie took Sane. it. And they just took Kyrie. It, it was a Kyrie horrible. Sane, Kyrie saying at the Tokyo Dome, I believe. Yeah. So they raised uh, Mercedes' hand, or uh, Willow did. Mercedes danced, showing off the air. So it's a very good show, and I hope they keep up the momentum. So it felt like so, a hot show. So Mercedes. I mean, the natural match is Mercedes and Willow down the road well of course they pretty much told you that yeah so i mean they could team together and then split there i mean i don't know if there's a hurry i mean presumably she's got somebody the pay-per-view so yeah obsessive somebody this pay-per-view is gonna be an interesting show um i mean obviously joe and swerve is the main event yes and 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 danielson and you know, I mean, that, well, they'll probably put the world title. You know, it's kind of weird because the real main event is Danielson and uh, and Will Ospreay. Well, of course. Yeah. I mean, I mean as well make real... a lights out match and go on last. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Except the thing is, is that I the, the lights out match. You know that they the the gimmick that they do. It's that's like with weapons and shit. And I I really don't think that they need any weapon. I hope they have like no weapons in that match. So a couple of notes from NXT. We had OTM versus Cruz del Toro and Joaquin Wild Tag Tournament match. 
the freaking Cruz del Toro and Joaquin Wild had a great match. Yeah, they are excellent wrestlers. They they're, won. They're, they're they're excellent, and they they never get to show it on on SmackDown, but they show it here whenever they're in NXT. We had Especially another spot where Joaquin did a dive off Bronco's back, and this dude flew straight up in the air and all the way down. It was awesome. Place went nuts. So Cruz and Del Toro move on in this tournament, and uh, this is a good opener. It's a good opener. We had uh, Andre Chase and Thea together, and Izzy Dame and Kiana James, are gonna, they're going to be having a match together tonight. And she says, I've got a partner. It is Kalani Jordan. And uh, Kalani later ended up getting beaten up, and uh, she ended up being replaced. And she's all over the, the Internet today, so I presume she doesn't actually have an injured knee. But they did the phantom attack, and she was selling her knee. And given the number of ACL injuries we've seen among women in wrestling... I was like, "Oh my god, don't even tell me another one down." I mean, but, I mean, I mean, NXT, aren't they like filled with like ACL repairs and There's uh, there's knee braces everywhere here on the show. Yeah. So Ruka just came back. Uh What's her name? The Lions Roar. She's Nikita, injured Nikita, again. Nikita, Nikita Lions hurt, hurt the second time, yeah. Yep, she's hurt again. I mean, as we go through this show, every woman, half the women I name have got an ACL injury. We had Roxanne doing a promo. Which actually was an excellent promo. She did a good job, yeah. I thought she did a great job here. And, uh, you know, she did the whole promo about why she turned heel, and it was all on the fans. And normally those are just like so generic, but she did a good job here. And she said that she was going to win Lyra's title. She was going to strip it away from her the way it got stripped away from her a year ago. And uh, out comes Ava. And Roxanne wanted Ava to just strip the title from Lyra and give it to her because Lyra is injured. Well, that was not about to happen. Ava says, no. I mean, I wasn't even the GM when the first thing happened. And then suddenly, everybody's favorite, Tatum Paxley, hits the ring. And Roxanne beats her ass. And and then uh, that was the end of the segment. We never got the uh, conclusion to this, this whole deal. We had a show-long storyline with the family and Ilya Dragunov where Ely shows up at the restaurant. Tony is insulted that he interrupted dinner, so he has his guys kidnap him and put him in the trunk. They drive to the bridge. They are going to throw Ely to his death, but then Tony says, no, no, this is not about the bridge. This is about this title, and I'm going to let you walk out of here. And as they're leaving, and he actually admitted throwing multiple people off this bridge, so he learned nothing from his stint in prison. So so, so he's like a, a, a mass murderer. Well, he's, 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 he, you can say that, yeah. He, I mean, he did murder Cole Carter, even though he showed up in uh, in Ring of Honor, which is, you know, as is, is, is as close to death as you can get since nobody sees it. I wish I didn't say that, but I just did. Let's take a ride, said Tony, and then, uh, oh, that was before the bridge. After the bridge, he just let him walk away, and then uh, Elia's final line was, Tony, I always find a way. So thank God nobody was killed here on this show. I can say mm-hmm. that. Lexus King beat Robert Stone. They're doing so much with this Robert Stone and Von Wagner, but, like, the fans just aren't into this. Lexus beats him, and then Von runs down to make the save, and Von is carrying Robert Stone to the back, and the fans are, like, so into this that they chant, he's a baby. Cause it was yeah, because he was like carrying a like a baby. Yeah, yeah. My God. They mm. were not into that. We had uh, Obafemi and Brooks Jensen, North American title. Obafemi destroyed this dude. And Briggs is watching on backstage, and he's pacing, and finally he comes down to the ring, and he's trying to root on poor Brooks. Brooks just gets absolutely destroyed. Like, destroyed so bad, I thought he was going to get cut today. And then uh, I could see Briggs and Oba for that I title. Briggs, I, can, I, I think Briggs and Oba's coming up. And Over then, WrestleMania uh, weekend. Didn't they have somebody else that they were uh, going in there with, with as well? I'm not sure. Yeah. But they, 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 they I, th- I think it's pretty clear Briggs and Obas is coming. Yeah. We had Ariana and Gigi. This match was not good. The finish was ridiculous. Ariana decides she wants to put the crown on Gigi. Not hit her with it. She wants to put it on her head. The referee's like, no, you can't do that. They get in the most fake tug of war you've ever seen. As they're doing a tug of war, Ariana accidentally gives Gigi, of all things, a low blow. Gigi sells it. Gigi then gives Ariana a low blow right in front of the referee. 
and the referee sees it and he calls for the disqualification. Ariana wins. She will now give Gigi a makeover. This was not good. Mm. We had a uh, Carmen Petrovich Sol Ruka promo, and Lola Weiss walked in and cut a promo on Carmen. Then Brindley Reese came in. Just too many people on this show. They're going to have a match at some point. Then we had Keanu and Easy Dame versus Thea Hale and Fallon. Fallon replaced the injured uh, Kalani. And as a match, I mean, this was fine. They're all getting better. Uh, ended up with Fallon taking out both women. And then uh, JC and Jasmine showed up and distracted Thea. And Thea ended up get, getting booted and pinned. And they had, a, they had a spot outside where uh, Izzy was going to boot Kiana, but JC pulled Kiana out of the way, and Izzy booted Thea, which led to the finish. And so afterwards, Thea's all sad, and she gets in the ring, and she cuts his promo on JC and Jasmine, and she just says, I thought you were the coolest girl in the locker room, thought you were my best friend, but really, I idolized you, thought you were my sister, but this is not me. This is you. I don't want to be anything like you. Sorry I'm a loser. I'm not cool enough for your toxic self, but that's fine because the old Thea Hale is back, bitch. Starts running in circles. So uh, she is no longer friends with uh, J.C. Jane. Hmm. Then we had... um, Well, J.C. Jane did kind of like screw up with Daniel. She sure did. And Riley was all happy backstage. You watch this on the screen, but then the No Quarter Catch crew showed up. And then Frazier and Axiom showed up, and it looks like we're going to have a six-man coming at some point. Sean Spears and Ridge Holland, no heat. Nobody cares about this program at all. And uh, finally, at the end, uh, Ridge throws him into the steps, takes him over to the table. Vic is screaming that Ridge doesn't want to do this, even though people get bumped through a table all the time. Puts uh, Spears through the table. Tries to hit him with a chair afterwards, but the ref stops him. Spears cradles him. C4 into the corner, pins him. So uh, Sean Spears gets the win. Like, nobody even understands that Ridge Holland's supposed to be a baby face. This just was not very good. And then we had by far the best thing on the show, main event segment. Trick Williams comes out. This guy is so over. The place goes crazy for him. He cut a great promo. Just talking about everything that had happened with him and Mello over the years. He'd always stood by Mello. He'd always been family. He'd always been the guy's brother. But then when the time came, Mello was not his brother. Mello was jealous. Mello wanted to stop him. He said everybody had told him that Mello was hating on him, but he didn't believe it. And finally, he asked him face to face, did you attack me? And you lied to my face. You lied about being a brother and you told me that we weren't on the same level, and you're right. We are not on the same level. You will never be on the same level as Trick Williams. And he vowed it, stand and deliver to give him a match and pay him back for everything. So all of a sudden, outcomes of all people, metaphor. It's Noam Dar, Oro Mensa, Lash Legend, and, and uh, Miss Jackson. And Trick says, guys, this is none of your business. Just leave me alone. And Noam comes out and he says, you know, we're kind of the same. You lost your best friend. I lost my cup. But I didn't go cry about it. I'm a big boy now. And uh, I'm moving on to bigger and better things. And Trick says, just leave. I don't want to deal with this right now. Just get out of here. And Noam says, I'll just tell you why I'm here. I am here to steal your hype because nobody is hotter than you are in this company right now. And Trick Williams says, you know, I'm looking at Lash over there. And it looks like she agrees. And Lash says, no, don't start that. Just listen to what Noam has to say. And so Noam uh, challenges him to a match next week. And they get into this big brawl. And Trick's laying out Oro. He's laying out uh, Noam Dar. And all of a sudden he turns around and Lash swings for the slap and he catches her hand. And so you've seen it a million times in wrestling. Heel woman tries to do something. Baby face guy grabs her, kisses her against her will. Can't do that in 2024. Yeah, that's uncool in 2024. Well, you know what they did? She goes to slap him. He grabs her and he dips her. But as he dips her, she stares into his eyes and she grabs him and she kisses Trick. This fucking crowd went nuts. They went nuts for this kiss. 
and Trick clears the ring. The place is going crazy, and they go off the air with, like, Lash outside the ring. She's holding her heart, and uh, this segment was awesome. And it was over, and I just thought, why is this not for the title? This is like... It was just glaring watching the build for the title match is Tony D's not throwing the guy off a bridge. And meanwhile, Trick's the hottest guy in the company. The feud with Melo's the hottest thing they've got. It's more over than anything. And it's like they're just having a match. So anyway, it was a great final segment to the show. But the rest of it was quite hit and miss. All right, take us through these Rampage spoilers. All right, um, so the first match, which actually is going to end up being the main event for Rampage, um, it's uh, Bennett, Roderick Strong, and Taven against Action Andretti and uh, Dante and Darius Martin. 12-minute match, really fun, high-flying match, real good. Uh, Roderick Strong pinned Action Andretti with the end of Heartache. Then uh, Tony Storm and Mariah May beat Kayla Sparks and Little... LMK, Little Mean Kathleen, basic squash match. Uh, Deanna Perrazzo's secret partner is Thunder Rosa. So it'll be Deanna and Thunder Rosa against Tony Storm and Mariah May on maybe on Wednesday, but certainly very maybe maybe on Saturday, Some, cer- certainly very soon. Then um, really strong match, Takeshita and Commander. I saw those two wrestle in PWG. In a the five Deanna match is, is uh, Dynamite. Dynamite on Wednesday? They announced it for Dynamite, yeah. Okay. All right. Takeshita and Commander. Um, Heard this it, match was awesome. Um, ten minutes, lots of high flying. Takeshita hit all his power moves, went with a scary spinning fisherman buster. Um, I would suspect that these two would have a great match. Big size difference, though. But, um, uh, yeah, when they did the, P- the PWG match, was was very good for what it was, but it wasn't great. But uh, this was longer. And then um, what will be the... It was the last match taped for the show, but I think it's going to open Rampage. Orange Cassidy, Trent Beretta over uh, John Silver and Evil Uno, 12 minutes. Fast-paced action. Uh, Superman pu- punch and that uh, crunchy deal. What, uh, strong... What is it? What's, what's strong, strong, strong Zero? or strong, Whatever that move is that, that Trent uses. And uh, they won... And uh, that's pretty much it. All righty. On that note, we're going to wrap it up, everybody. New Observer's up on the front page. New back issue as well. And uh, Dave and I are going to be back this weekend with all of the news. Uh, A bunch of shows up over the last couple of days. Lance is watching uh, this AW show, so he's going to talk about that tomorrow, 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern, and uh, Observer Live as well. So a lot of things to check out. And that's it. We'll talk to you again after a while.